Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, so, big picture, it, it's always a sort of a risk to to sort of stay so abstract that we won't be able to sort of look at some facts or observations or go deep technically. So I thought, uh, depending on how you respond, and I don't know how technical of an audience you are, I might go actually a bit deeper uh, technically, just at points. Um, and if I lose you, just raise your hands. Just <laughs> like, the, don't ask a question, just raise your hands. You say, I lost, you lost me, and I'll, I'll move on. Uh, how many people speak good English? Okay, everybody, perfect. <laughs> All righty. So, um, cities. You know, cities have, you know, have been around for what, six and a half thousand years, more or less. And um, their success uh, grew them so big to the point that today we have cities uh, at scales that we've never imagined. Right? We're in the process of the fastest wave of urbanization in human history. Uh, and you, know, you can think, I don't, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie uh, uh, about the city by, by famous urbanist Louis Mumford. He coined the city the place of heaven and hell. Heaven is where people meet, right? People exchange, exchange ideas, exchange money, uh, exchange genes, come together, right? Uh, it's a place where human, humans create together, right? Now, at the same time, uh, the coming together also necessitates infrastructures. And a lot of those systems that support our life in cities uh, can actually be counterproductive to the life in cities. Some of them are very productive, some of them are counterproductive. Uh, some of them are both, right? It's a complex system, uh, and all of that lives together. Sorry, my clicker is jumping. So, just, you know, why cities? You probably have seen these numbers many times. Um, but I, I'm just going to repeat, just in case. So, cities cover only 2% of the Earth's inhabitable land area. So, very little area. Um, today, 55% almost of the planet lives in cities. Now, there are many other numbers regarding what they produce and consume. For example, about 75% of emissions uh, a, or emission equivalent take place in cities and their infrastructure, and about 75 to 80% of the world's GDP is produced in them. Right? So there are many good reasons to come together. Uh, it also uh, is a place that because so much human activity t takes place in, um, exemplifies the challenges that the planet faces. So this is why we decided to focus on cities at the Sensible City Lab. But not only that, at the same time, there is a fundamental change in technology that's taking place at the moment. Right? We are all carrying very smart, um, strong computers in our pocket. Um, people can talk to people, and you can talk to a remote server, to a machine, and download data. Um, our average car today has hundreds of sensors and over a hundred control units within it embedded. Uh, and you can slap one of those, this is a standard machine-to-machine -machine modem, on almost anything, and it goes online. Right? So people can talk to people who can talk to machines, they can talk back to people, they can talk to objects in our environment. So another way to think about it is, our, is, is that there's almost like a natural evolution of the web. A web is a virtual environment, and today it, it merges with a physical environment. It's just a natural step. It's not smart objects, Internet of Things. It's just a natural evolution. The computer itself becomes so small that it becomes part of everything physical around us. So uh, our environment uh, becomes cyber-physical. People live within that, and it presents many opportunities. You can really rethink some of the key issues that cities face, for example, in light of these new technologies, but also you could come up with totally new uh, ideas for how people can live with technologies in new ways. Now, at the Sensible City Lab, what we did, um, the lab was founded in 2004, and we've been exploring this subject matter in partnership with mayors throughout the world, large cities in, in, in all the large continents. And for each place, we'd identify a challenge and tackle it with some technological intervention, a study, new ways of sensing. I'm going to glance quickly over some of the stuff we did, 
and then sort of take a step back uh, and try to reflect on why might people be coming together in cities all together. And then zoom in on what we can do today in transportation and in mobility as a particular sort of case study. So we've done projects on a range of topics from access to jobs and education to clean air and water, uh, as well as waste. In this case, we were in Seattle uh, with Qualcomm and waste management um, tagging trash, asking where trash is going. So literally putting sensors, this is almost a decade ago already, uh, yeah. that go on, on garbage, any kind of garbage, and then asking where is it going. Right, so you know, we, this is deploying it in, C in, in Seattle and seeing these are two landfills here below in, uh, uh, in Oregon. Above is Vancouver, where stuff leaves, leaves to Asia from. And these things that go very far turned out to be electronic waste and hazardous waste. Now, what was interesting in this for us is that it also all of a sudden highlighted invisible processes, right? We, you know, this is recycling, right? People were paid to recycle these pieces of electronics, and it turned out that some of them traveled 3,000 miles before reaching their destination. That's definitely not the intention. But there are so many hands involved that nobody actually had a macro view. So think about it in the abstract. You can throw sort of a piece of digital something, uh, even on trash, and it all of a sudden comes to life, and it can help us to understand it better and maybe improve it. Uh, that's one example. Uh, another example is a project that, that is sponsored by uh, Kuwait, uh, where we have robots diving into the sewer to quantify the microbiome of neighborhoods. Right? The sewer contains a lot of information about what's, what's in our body. Uh, there are about an order of magnitude more microbes in our gut than we have cells in our body. And these microbes can basically tell us so much about uh, 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 our state of uh, well-being, um, that it's really sort of a wasted resource today, if you think about it, the sewer. So we created these robots, uh, and we started counting bacteria in different neighborhoods, and then you can create models and see how uh, diseases become contagious and flow over space and time between different places. Uh, how does access to a certain kind of, uh, let's say, level of income, uh, education, transportation may impact the well-being of a particular neighborhood or another. So think of this as a resource that allows us to understand another dimension of human health in support of better serving it. I'm glancing over this very fast intentionally. These are some examples of what we found doing PCR on, 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 um, on what's in people's guts in a neighborhood. We also looked at uh, cell phone data and GPS traces to understand human mobility. This is a project we did with Telefon Itali uh, Telef Telecom Italia and, uh, and ATTAC, the uh, bus company in Rome, a while back in 2006, asking how do people move? The red spots are pedestrians, calculating uh, the movement of cell phones in an aggregated way on the Telecom Italia network, and comparing it with the mo motion of buses for better planning. We also looked at uh, how people communicate m sort of on the global scale. <laughs> well, it's not really important, but I'll try to play it. Yeah, this is with AT&T. It's a project we showed at MoMA, looking at how New York communicates with the rest of the world, trying to understand some of the patterns of A, how immigrants lay themselves out in space just by detecting where people call to and from in a particular, you know, piece of land area. You can really do like a real-time census. We also looked at how commerce takes place over time and space. It gave us a lot of information about communities, what people are doing, just by observing sort of this digital exhaust of the, uh, of the communications network. Again, I'm glancing over this quickly. Specifically, I want to zoom in on asking these questions. We, we're thinking about smart cities. What is a smart city? Is it, is it a city full of robots? An AI, is it a city uh, where, which is optimized so that everything, all the systems synchronize? Maybe, but you know, if you think about the city, the city is a, is a lump of concrete and steel and it's got a lot of inertia. Um, it's quite constant, right? If you lived on the moon and looked at a city six and a half thousand years ago and you saw a city today, there are some things that actually haven't changed much, right? 
there's big, big arteries and buildings in between on a two-dimensional grid. Uh, this, there's good reason why the places we inhabit look that way, from an energy perspective, also from a social perspective. Right? Another way to think about it is that the city cannot really respond to human need in real time. A smart city is that the street cannot double its width when twice as many cars show up. What makes a city smart is what we decide to do every minute. Moreover, what makes a city smart is the people that are in it. Cities were always attractive because, again, the sort of the heaven aspect of things, because they are the place where people come together. And I want to sort of think together with you about what kind of technologies might be able to empower that. Because that's what would make a smart city. It's not, it's not the fact that the bus synchronizes with the, with the, with the bicycle uh, rental system. That's nice, right? But the people are smart. I mean, it's a very different thing. Uh, so let's look for a second at some of the underlying characteristics of communications and start asking what can we learn from that about how people behave in a city or in between cities. This is data that we took from multiple cell phone service operators throughout the world. This specific study uh, started in Belgium with Orange, and we looked at scaling. Uh, we looked at how people communicate, number of calls, length of calls, inside a city and outside. And the first question we asked was, is there a difference in the length and intensity of communication when you live next to somebody versus when you live far away? When you're in a global city, so I'm sure a lot of you have friends outside Berlin, so you're saying, oh, it doesn't matter. I have a cell phone, I can be friends with anybody anywhere in the world, and I have a, you know, an app. Uh, let's see, right? First of all, so look here, this is, I'm just showing you the plots from the paper, so sorry, it's ugly. But this is distance, all right? That's within the city, that's going out of the city. So intensity of communication remains rather constant when you're inside the city, and as soon as you go out, it begins to decay and decay and decay. What, it, what does it mean? It means that we talk more to those who are near us. That's interesting. It actually looks like a gravity model, so we just applied some sort of, we looked for a certain constant, we found it, it matches the data. Gravity model means, just like gravity, when two things become farther and far away, uh, there is an inverse relationship to the square of the distance in terms of the intensity in this case of calling, right? So we said, okay, let's let a machine find the most tight-knit communities in a place. So if we talk to our neighbors, right, in a constant way, do we talk to our neighbors more than we talk to people who are far away? And if we do, do we talk to the people who live right next to us? This is a plot of Belgium, okay, that's just coordinates. And these are the communities that a computer sort of selected from person-to-person -person communication on the Orange network. And to me, the first observation that was interesting was all these patches are continuous. What it means is that people really talk to their neighbors. That's totally non-intuitive. If you go back to the, to the mid-90s, George Gilder and Nicolas Negroponte really had a sort of an idea that cities are going to disappear because we, we are becoming virtual beings. You know, think of you know, an Oculus Rift. Will we still need to come together? There's something a lot more fundamental going on. Right? We asked, this is more of a joke, we asked the computer to pick two communities in, 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 in Belgium and look where the line goes. Uh, <laughs> and, and so that's the, the bilingual this, uh, sort of se separating line and you see Brussels there, which is where people speak both languages. Right? And you can do this in many other places. In this case, this is done in the United States. And, and you, can see, uh, you can see sort of how, does the, how the algorithm works in this, in this short video. Um, and then I'll show you a little bit of the results. But I'm going somewhere with this. This is not the, the end point. Raise your hands if I'm losing you. If you need a bailout. So person-to-person -person communication, this is AT&T's network, 80 million people for a year, on an individualized level and anonymized. 
So we're looking at those arcs. These are each a connection between two people. And then we cluster it using unsupervised learning uh, on, on a computer, on a machine. And then we map it. It's very simple. And you get these regions, right? And sometimes the surprising thing is that a lot of these regions overlap with, with political boundaries, sometimes with other kinds of boundaries. Look here, right? California. <coughs> it always wanted to split into two different states, right? Look at where the line passes, northern and southern California, right? Look, look at Texas. It's insular, indeed, right? The polit the, th this is a community of people who talk to each other on the phone. And what the computer found is that they talk to each other more than they talk to the rest of the country. And the boundary of that community is identical to the political boundary of the state. To me, this was non trivial to, to, to sort of see that. I thought, mm, that's interesting. People really talk to people they can meet physically. Right? Look at New Jersey, it disappears. <laughs> New Jersey basically is absorbed half into New York and, and half into Pennsylvania. And so on and so forth. And we did this in the UK and in France and in Italy, Lega Nord, right? Uh, it's, 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 it's really clear. Uh, Portugal split in two. I don't have a German one to show, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, I mean, again, sorry for the, for the ugly plot. Um, there's a really good, this is a paper by, by Bettencourt from, from 2013. What he was talking about, and it's been, it's been well shown in, in the literature, what he, he was talking about is scaling behavior in cities. There are many good reasons why we come together so so, so close. Number one, GDP, patents, creative industries, all these scale super linearly with city size. That's what you're seeing here at the top. GDP here, patents. There's a super linear scaling, meaning if you get two people living in a place making one patent a year, four people living in a place would make more than double. Same is true for GDP. Right? Same is true for gene diversity, it turns out. And on the contrary, resource consumption scales sublinearly, meaning we need less asphalt to move around, fewer gas stations to fuel our cars, fewer schools, fewer hospitals, fewer, less copper to move electricity. So basically, we consume less and produce more the bigger the place we live in is. Right? So th this is sort of a fundamental thing that attracts people together. It's not just the economy. Right? It is a lot that supports the survival uh, uh, of, of, our, of our species uh, when we come together in bigger numbers, right? And perhaps communications is an, un is an underlying factor of this, right? It's what enables this human exchange. So the reason I, I fussed on this is just to give you sort of a, this is one example, there's a lot of research happening uh, on these topics at the moment. This is just one example. Uh, that could show, first of all, how can we use the data that, is u that, that today is flowing through our networks for other purposes, for communications, uh, for, for transportation, um, etc., to gain a new understanding about the places we live in, but also, specifically in this case, can we start to think about cities as places where people succeed, where people create, and ask, how can we make technologies that empower that? Right? That maybe is the smart city, right? How can we make technologies that help us succeed, that help us create, that help us uh, um, consume less, right? Uh, if you look at the infrastructures in cities, they come under great pressure, right? The success of, city as we, of, of cities, as we said, uh, puts great burden on their infrastructures, whether it's communications, transportation, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus specifically on transportation um, and then go back to asking how can we think of trans sort of smart transportation in the context of empowering individuals, of empowering people, of empowering communities. Right? So look at demand for transportation. 2010, 25.8, I'm going to try to say it right, trillion passenger kilometer per year consumed. Okay, Meaning that's the demand. 
in, in, in kilometer values. Look at what's happening by 2030, almost 70% more. And by the middle of the century, we're looking at almost two and a half times more demand for urban transportation. So maybe what it means is that we'll be lucky if we'll keep today's congestion by the middle of the century. We're not even solving for that, right? We're solving for a lot greater problem. This is not new. This is demand for urban transportation is up there. This is rural transportation down here. Uh, this is normalized to 2000, right? That's 2016 here. So they bifurcated a long time ago. And it's, if you go back to the, to the late 80s, it's already happened. So people are consuming mobility, consuming meaning demanding mobility more and more in cities and less and less outside them. Cities as in metro areas. But we know that there so many cities are facing gridlock almost on a daily basis. So we need to completely rethink the way we're moving around in cities if we want to be able to account for two and a half times more demand. Forget about you know, the traffic jam you're in at 8 a.m. today. That's nothing, right? So governments get the point, right? Actually. Germany just announced that it wants to ban combustion engine cars by 2030. France and UK, all these states in the United States are having zero emission requirements by 2025. China is making big uh, statements about zero emission requirements. They wanted to have 8% already by next year. They dialed it back to the following year. The point is not the numbers. Even if these are half met, the point is that it represents a will to take action and perhaps create a world which has a very different kind of transportation system in it. I'll give you some examples. This is United States, the age of driver's license acquisition with respect um, to how many people have a driver's license. Okay, Look at 18 year olds. On the left it's 1983, on the right uh, it's 2014. In 1983 it was 82%. By 2014, it's just over 60. It's a huge drop. That whole sort of gap on the left there, that little half moon, is basically a, an age shift where people buy cars at a later age. Maybe what it means is that, actually, if you, if you look at the research, it shows that people mostly buy a car, millennials buy a car when they have kids, when, when they need to have a car. So maybe the car is no longer an emotional or a representation of your identity as we you know in the 50s, you wouldn't get a job, you wouldn't get married if you didn't have a car, right? It was a sign of freedom, a sign of your identity. Today, it's a necessity. You, get, you wait as long as you can until you absolutely must have it and then you buy it, right? So our relationship is changing to it emotionally. States, right, are beginning to legislate around it, trying to create a new environment for cars. Uh, but what could these new forms of mobilities be? Right? We can't just lock cars out of the city and say, okay, everything's going to be great and we're going to use bicycles and walk around. It doesn't work. The cities became way too big. Right? You know, one way to think about this is, is, is ride hailing. Right? We've, been, we've been hearing about Uber and Lyft and DD and many other companies for you know, quite some time now and it's, it's gaining success. Uh, and we all are familiar with the problem which sort of made them rise in the first place. Right? You're, you're, you're waiting in one place, can never find a taxi, and then you go to another place and you see tons of taxis and no demand, right? There's really a mismatch between supply and demand when the system is not sort of connected, right? So we took data from New York uh, taxis, 150 million trips. Later it was Singapore taxis, and, uh, and today it's, it's one of the big ride-sharing companies as well, uh, and started to analyze this, right? This is the, the, the yellow is pickup, the blue is drop-off, uh, and we started to create what we call a shareability network, asking how many people can we put in a car given a delay? Meaning a delay is the extra amount of time you'd have to wait versus riding alone. A and that gives you sort of a sense of, first of all, what can we gain from automatic dispatch, right? What are the efficiencies we can have? How many cars can we remove from the road and still have the same level of service that we're receiving today? First thing we observed is that there's a lot of symmetry in how people move. Right? So look at these, uh, almost the same number of trips between two places, it immediately suggests a large rapid form of transportation. Right? Um, 
And this exists all over the city, especially in lower Manhattan. It was published, and we really understood that with the right vehicle, you can find this paper if you're curious about this, in the Proceeding of National Academies of Science, 2014. Um, we realized that with the right kind of vehicles, we could service the city with a, for the same kind of mobility uh, that is demanded today, for the same behavior we have today, with about 50% of its vehicles. It's great, right? It's not bad. Um, So in that context, self-driving cars are proposed as an ultimate solution. Right? The idea of it, the whole premise of a self-driving car... <laughs> I think it's my two-minute cue. Um, yeah. The whole idea of a self-driving car is that we'll be able to do ride pooling in the most effective way, to put as many people as possible into one vehicle. Mm -hmm. right? And that's, that, again, here's a question. Can it really help us address the problem uh, at hand. Can we put enough people in a vehicle, not based on just having a robot for a driver and driving costs down, but based on actual human demand for transportation, meaning where you live versus where you work and how it overlaps with somebody else's demand for transportation. That's key, right? Where you live is not going to change tomorrow because Uber came out with a promotion. You live where you live, you work with you where you work, it's not negotiable. You might wait a little bit longer for a knockdown in the price. So we looked at this, and, and, and I can't share much about the results. This is a, an analysis we did about autonomous infrastructure. Uh, what we realized is that while sharing has a strong potential to reduce congestion by increasing uh, car occupancy, um, even with 100% um, sharing, we'll have a hard time to fill a five-seater sedan in the city. We have some more robust numbers about this, but it's, it's not much better than what we have today. And the reason is that there's quite a bit of individuality in the way we move in urban areas, right? It has to do with land use, with the designation of space, uh, which defines how we move and how we lay ourselves out in space, where we live, where we work, where we spend time with friends and loved ones. Which means that unless we build small vehicles, right, we're not going to really address the problem of transportation in cities. Now again, this is one result of analysis. Again, put this in context of, you know, what can we do with technology? One of the things that come out is that we're able to see things we could never see before, right? Um, you know, that led us to, to work on bicycles. By the way, this topic became the subject matter of a, of a, of a startup that was spun out of the lab uh, called Super Pedestrian that I'm involved with, uh, that's focusing on developing technologies for one and two person vehicles. I want to give you one quick example. So bicycles, right? Bicycles are great, it's growing, many people are using them in Berlin, particularly it's a... Uh, uh <laughs> and uh, the problem with the bike is that since the bike was invented, the average city grew by about 20 times, right? So the bike is not relevant for most people's commute. About 85% of people can't make it from home to work on a bike. So we partnered back then uh, created a partnership between the lab at MIT and the mayor of Copenhagen, Rit Bjargo. Copenhagen was a city of cars until the 70s. Then they did a whole bunch of policy changes and became a real bike city. So we could s study from them and, l and learn. Um, we realized that 15 kilometers is a big cutoff uh, when people stop cycling. Uh, 15 kilometer trips. Hills are a big deal, right? Oh, sorry, having troubles with the clicker. Um, one more time. So we said, okay, let's electrify the bike. Let's put a motor on a bicycle. But the electric bike actually isn't new. The, it was invented in the 1890s. And it's a booming market, right? In, in Germany, it's 40% of the European market. It, uh, and and uh, uh, it's quite successful here. It's reduced the number of cars on the road. It's really helping people move around freely on larger distances. Uh, but there's a problem. They're heavy, they're clunky, and they're very pricey. Right? So in this particular project, we, we, we came up with a robot, right? That, sorry, let me go to the computer. We came up with a robot that uh, uh, can expand the reach of the human body. It imitates a human with 70-something sensors and then multiplies the human power and making it feel as if you're riding a regular bike, but in fact, you're about 20 times stronger. So again, a way to use autonomy in robotics, but just to empower human motion. So the natural feeling of moving your body, 
But again, expanding your reach so you can deal with the big distances that our cities afford today. Right, so this is, this is what's inside, there's a whole bunch of technology, there's, there's uh, a control system, motors, batteries, uh, a radio, all that is put inside that unit, which you can throw on almost any bike, and that's how you make it affordable, because it's a kind of a Ferrari of technology. Uh, and then when you move, it learns from your, from your motion, with many, many different cues, um, and then amplifies you. And you can write apps for that, just like you do for a smartphone, um, collect information from the environment and share it with other cyclists. Again, but think about this as one example of how you can use autonomy and how you can use um, robotics, how you can use data in order to uh, empower individual mobility. Empower almost in the sort of sense of legal performance enhancement. Um, so, you know, if you ride this thing, it's, it's really just like using a a regular bike, you can control it with your phone if you want, otherwise keep the phone in your pocket. But a whole bunch of data is collected so that you can learn more about your physical activity, uh, customize your ride, etc. It also diagnoses itself and fixes its own problem, calibrates its own sensors. You don't know anything about it, you just ride it like you ride a regular bike. So what's next? For, for this particular effort, you know, we're looking at sc scaling this into larger scale vehicles, right? two-seater vehicles, remember, we can't fill a five-seater sedan, so maybe it's, it's a two-seater sedan. Or maybe it's systems for a two-seater electric vehicle. Maybe it's partially human-powered. We'll see in the city many kooky, tiny vehicles that move together and combine with people. But my point is more that maybe with the right use of technology, we'll make spaces that look more like this uh, than sort of fully robotic and automized spaces. Um, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>